Hello, everybody. Welcome to um, MA Translation and MA Linguistics Taster Lesson. My name is Nana Sato Rosberg. I'm head of School of Languages, Cultures, and Linguistics. I'm also chair of the Center for Translation Studies. And today I'm going to provide you a 10 minute taster lesson on MA translation. A very simple question What is translation? So when you start studying with us, I will ask you this question because many people think, oh, what is translation? It's so simple to, to answer. This is a very easy answer, you know, easy question to answer. But actually, in the fact, it's not so easy. When you study translation studies, um, when we talk about what translation studies is or what translation is, we'll start talking about Roman Jakobson. And Roman Jakobson, he, he was a scholar of linguistics and he made a kind of definition of what translation is. He divided translation into three categories. One, intralingual translation. Two, interlingual translation. And three, intersemiotic translation. First one, intralingual translation. What does it mean? Let's think about in the context of Japanese because I'm from Japan and my native language is Japanese. So in, in the Japanese context, when we talk about intralingual translation, for example, it's translation from standard Japanese, like a Tokyo dialect is considered as a standard Japanese, to translate it into, let's say, Osaka dialect, okay? Um, so those two languages are both Japanese, but considered as a very different type of Japanese. And, and so you could translate from Tokyo dialect into Osaka dialect. This is a kind of interlingual translation. Um, second one is interlingual translation. This is normally widely considered as translation. Like this is translating from English into Chinese or translating from Arabic into English. And the third one, intersemiotic translation. So you would, you would translate a different medium into a different medium. What does it mean? For example, you translate from a novel into film. And this is the intersemiotic translation. Um, so if you are interested in this Roman Jacobson's definition of translation, please have a look at this paper. Of course, this paper was written in 1959. Translation studies scholars developed definition or notion of translation more you know, widely beyond this. But this is the starting point when we talk about translation studies. So next one, very simple translation practice, because I don't know what kind of languages you can speak, but I, I believe you can read English. That's why I decided to bring this practice today. So there is a photo here and you can see maybe there are two elephants and standing on, on, on the floor, right? You can see that. So can you please translate this photo into a text? You can describe any ways, but you see this photo as an original, and then you need to translate this photo into a text to describe what you see. Yam. <laughs> because I cannot talk to the audience, so could you try to translate this photo? Oh, uh, into <laughs> Chinese? Uh, into yeah. English, please, because oh. I don't understand oh. Chinese. Uh, elephant? Yes. Yeah. And uh, the other one... Sentence, uh, oh. please. Could you make a oh. sentence to describe uh. this photo? Oh, this is... Uh, uh, there are two elephants. And one more. Okay. Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah. I think it's a correct answer. <laughs> okay. So in the classroom, I ask this question to, to like uh, 20 students. And normally, all the students answer differently. Okay, and let's see the examples of answers. One big elephant and one small elephant, a purple Lego animal and a pink Lego animal, brother elephant and sister elephant, father elephant is protecting his daughter while she's asleep, 
lovely Legos in someone's living room. So no, 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 no. These are all translations of this photo. Yam, do you think there is any wrong answer? Any, any wrong, wrong answer? Oh. Mm. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, but they're all acceptable, I think. Exactly, yeah. they're all <laughs> correct, but they are looking at this photo from a different perspective. They interpret, they understand this photo differently. Why? Because they have a different perspective, they have a different views, or what they are interested in through this photo is different, right? So what I want to say here is that if there are 10 translators, there are 10 kinds of translations. It, it means, it doesn't mean, so that means that there is no superior great translation in this world. So if you want to translate something, there are various way of translating the original. How you want to translate is up to you in principle. But this is where you can learn theories, methodologies, and various type of practice to make your own best translation. Um, I've got only 10 minutes, so my practice must be very short. So the final slide. If you come to SOA SMA translation program, you can learn and discuss theory methods and the practice of translation beyond Western oriented discourse, okay? As a practical translation, we offer Japanese, Chinese, Korean, Arabic, Turkish, Swahili, and Persian. We don't offer any uh, sort of Western language pair. It's all beyond Western languages. And you can learn any aspects of practical translation, including language and culture and technology. So if you want to be a translator, it is very important to learn how to use, for example, machine translation. And so you can learn all these kind of uh, practical translations if you come to our MA translation program and together with extremely multilingual and the multicultural staff and students, you can learn MA translation. It is extremely important for you to be in a location like SOAS because in London, you know, people speak more than 400 languages in London. And at SOAS, we offer more than 20 languages. And most of the staff are at least bilingual, but many staff can speak four to 10 languages. It's a fantastic place to learn MA translation. Um, I'm going to stop here because I tend to speak too much always. Um, and I know this was too short, but if you're interested in our MA translation program, uh, please get in touch with me. Also, we have uh, this Center for Translation Studies. So if you Google Center for Translation Studies, you can see our activities. Um, thank you very much. Dan, I was a bit too fast to speak. but. <laughs> That was, that was fantastic, Nana. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dan. Um, a really interesting insight into translation here at SOAS. I particularly enjoy using the, the Lego elephants, and that's a fantastic question to ask. It's a really good way for us to be able to think about translation. Thank you. So um, I will just say as well that if anyone, as a reminder, if you do have any questions, please do feel free to use the question and answer box, and we'll make sure that we get those answered for you during the session. And just to add as well, uh, we've been joined by a student ambassador, so if you have any questions that are about the more student perspective of studying at SOAS, we can um, look at answering those for you as well. I'll now invite Jan um, to share his screen and his slides and, uh, and to talk to you further. Thank you very much, Dan. Let me share my screen with you all. Hello, welcome to SOAS and um, welcome to our uh, SOAS postgraduate taste session at the School of Languages, Cultures, and Linguistics. My name is Yuan Zhang. I'm a senior lecturer at, um, in linguistics and the languages of China. I also work as program convener for um, MA linguistics and uh, MA in linguistics and an intensive language. So what I have prepared for you today first is some um, 
very general um, introduction about um, SOAS, especially about our School of Languages, Cultures, and Linguistics. Um, and because of the time constraint, I'll be rather quick. So this is our school with the tradition, with this range of languages, and with our UK's oldest linguistics department, as where both me and Anna are working as well. And also we have our, we pride ourselves with our endangered language archive, and we have students and staff from many different countries. And we have expertise in some of the world's key regions in terms of language. So this is some um, School of Languages, Cultures and Linguistics. There are these small details. And also I want to add that our MA in Linguistics program is also a pathway which is called Language Documentation and Description. Um, arguably the only one available in this country. Um, yeah. Um, what if if we want some descriptions about our department and about what we do as a bunch of linguists working at SOAS, um, usually we would uh, come up with this um, first description is that we explore linguistic diversity through um, a study of language. But today I have prepared a special menu for you because um, um, I've been working all day in fact. Um, I wanted to think about some specific topic that um, I want to provide to you. And if you come to our other sessions, then our other colleagues will give you some other recipe to look at. So I want to talk about how we explore linguistic diversity through the study of semantics. Um, I have here a special module in mind for those of you who have studied semantics before and how we make a difference at SOAS. And for those of you who have never studied ling uh, semantics or even linguistics, it doesn't matter because uh, we'll start from scratch and we'll teach you how to deal with the study of meaning in different languages. So here I'm referring to this uh, special module on semantics, um, which starts without assuming too much knowledge about the discipline. And then you also have another module to start with that is called Minion Interpretation for Term 1. And this one is, in fact, for Term 2 that I'm teaching. But we'll quickly go through the basics of formal semantics in our module for the first three or four weeks. And then we move on to look at a range of topics. So let me give you this um, outline so that um, I hope I can impress you with the uniqueness of our syllabus. Um, so for example, the first four weeks um, will be related to painting students with the basics of modern semantics. Um, that is about sentential semantics and sense and reference, reference and denotation, proposition, truth, et cetera. And then um, we deal with the basic logics and the representation and interpretation issues. And then we talk about semantic type theory, lambda abstraction, reduction, and generalized quantifier theory. So the uh, left column constitute the warm-up, um, I should say, that is what, what you, some of you may have already studied um, in your um, bachelor time. And then we move on to something more unique of our own that I've been developing these years. Um, week five will be dev devoted to the study of in indexicals. You know that if we have that dealt with axis and indexicals, you know that there's a pragmatic parameter that is usually talked, of, talked about in textbooks. But here we want to introduce the semantic dimension, which is um, more rigorous and which nicely complements with the content of the past four weeks, how we introduce indexicals into the study of formal meaning. And then in week six, I treat the varieties of NP interpretation, which is not usually covered in detail in any textbooks. Um, how do we interpret notions such as definiteness, definiteness indefiniteness, um, attributiveness, uniqueness, specificity, and non-specificity, generics, etc. And we pay more attention to encouraging students, inviting them to look at their own language, look at the language they are studying in intensity. 
to see how these semantic notions can be manifested in these different languages and what are their uniqueness and how we in return can incorporate them into our theorization and into our more generic discussion into our what I would like to call semantic botany studies. That is, you look at various types of meaning and you try to give them proper treatments. And then week seven is devoted to the study of literal meaning itself, um, because I want to identify a lot of gaps in the literal meaning, and that can lead us quickly into the recent debate about contextualism versus semantic minimalism. So later today, I will provide some more slides about this content because I think this, this part is more accessible. And then um, in week eight, um, that's um, my favorite topic is about conditionals and counterfactuals. Um, we treat conditionals as one interesting meeting point where in which many complicated semantic notions have been drawn and can be implemented to the study of this sophisticated phenomenon of conditionals. And we look at conditionals worldwide, that is in what other languages and how these conditionals can have different guises. And in this sense, then counterfactuals be even more interesting. And week nine is about plurals. And we know that plurals um, is always a thorny issue in semantics. And then finally, we look at um, semantics and pragmatics borderline, which is the treatment of presupposition, um, which boasts a vast literature that nobody can claim to have read fully. So this is the outline, and I hope that um, you find it interesting. But then I can quickly talk for another uh, five minutes about this um, special topic that we treat in week seven that is called literal meaning and explicature. Um, we probably all know what literal meaning is, but then um, it mainly refers to a sentence meaning. Yeah. So the, the, the meaning of a sentence according to the modern semantic point of view is this two conditions. And um, we will like to open up this question, the recent question, the debate is to whether truth value can be established at the sentence level or not. If it cannot, then we can't claim that we are paying full-fledged literal meaning um, sentence level. You know, if that is the case, then we want to access contextual information. Um, we want, we need expertise from pragmatics uh, in order to sort out the full-fledged literal meaning. Um, that, in fact, can be a rather radical claim because it seems to endanger the foundation of modern semantics. Um, because that means that semantics can never be autonomous. It cannot stand alone because you can't even establish truth values at the level of sentence. So this leads to um, interesting claims. We can look at a range of cases, like um, the indexicals we have already mentioned. Yeah. In what ways that sentential meaning can be incomplete and how they exhibit themselves in different languages. So we look at some examples, um, it'll be interesting. Um, yeah. Um, Examples like we talk, it is raining. I had Christmas turkey. I learned syntax. Examples like these can seem to be quite self contained in terms of syntax. They are complete. There's nothing wrong with meaning, nothing wrong with grammar. Yeah. Uh, they can't be more complete um, in this sense. But in fact, from a semantic point of view and from the point of view of um, establishing truth values, we'll say that all of them are semantically underdetermined. They are incomplete. Because when you say we talked, I want to ask when and where. It is raining. Well, you probably mean it is raining here 
and now. Yeah. But then um, I may be telling you this sentence over my mobile phone. Then you have to get it as it is raining over there. That's where the person is making the phone call, probably from London. While well, the receiver is somewhere in Tokyo, for example. And I had Christmas turkey. But when? Last year or this year? In fact, this year I couldn't get a Christmas turkey. Well, I learned syntax. Again, where uh, does it make a difference? Did you learn it at MIT or not? Well, all these can be interesting and you may start to get the feeling that every sentence can be underdetermined in this way or that, right? And that gives rise to a particular claim called indexicalism. Uh, those people claim that um, wherever you have a sentence that is underdetermined in meaning, you can always posit some hidden indexical somewhere. So the sentence will appear to be a bit, um, I want to say, grotesque in the sense that um, you don't realize how many indices can be introduced in a simple sentence. So when you're talking about examples like your coffee is too strong, but strong for what? Your tea is not strong enough. Well, it depends on who is drinking it, right? He is too talkative. For what occasion? You are so nice. Well, to what extent? It tastes all the same compared to what? You can go on with um, all these um, ordinary examples. He submitted his proposal to the head. The head of what, right? The mayor agreed to give a talk. Of which city? The parents decided to make a visit to the school. Well, the parents of whom? Yeah. So you may start realizing that even nouns have hidden indices. And there are metonymic expressions, uh, for example, the three witches. Then implicitly, you are referring to the Shakespearean play, Macbeth. Yeah. Um, so all these, I give you um, some titles that's um, introduced by Jason Stanley and um, Zoltan, Zoltan Sabo um, some time ago. And um, what we propose as treatments are, as I've said, uh, composite hidden in indices. Um, so sentences will look something like this. You are seeing the indices here in parentheses, right? And um, then other people mention a whole array of other sentences. And uh, unfortunately, they're all from English. So that invites us to look at many, many other languages, um, especially at source. We love doing that. Right? So for examples like um, the ones I'm showing now, right? and we find some proper place to plug in some indices or not. If you can't find any proper places, then it is hard to sort out the correct logical form for these sentences. Right? So here are the examples um, which um, have been proposed in such a way with the hope that they will provide counter examples to semantic indexicalism from Stanley and others. He ran to the cliff and jumped. Did he jump down? or he's just jumping at the cliff. Sarah has a temperature, but everywhere has a temperature. That's not what is meant, right? Um, so what is meant here is Sarah has an unusually high temperature. She's the only person that can think. Well, um, what do you mean? Everyone can think, right? So this who can think has a special connotation and uh, the rest as well. So we have then the introduction of a new school of thought related to these examples who call themselves radical contextualism. They think that um, literal meaning should be freely enriched. You can never plug in any indices at definite places because they are not to be found 
we don't know where to plug in. And enrichment is everywhere. It is online. So this gives us contribution uh, controversies, and this invites us um, from an empirical point of view to look at a wide range of cases in many, many other examples. Yeah. Um, in many, many other languages. How do we fare, right? When we look at examples in um, Berber, in Chinese, in um, Burmese, for example, right? So this is what I would um, usually lead our students uh, in investigating, uh, following these debates, but trying to look beyond English. Um, so it started with concerns with language use and affability in verbal communication um, that can carry us further uh, than the debates in the philosophy of language. Right. So what next? Yeah. Um, what we propose to do is to look at a, well, still another theory in pragmatics, which is called Literature theory in relevance theoretic parameters. But we wanted to step further. We want to identify research gaps. So we attempt to introduce a more rigorous formal characterization of explicature. But this is not an end in itself. The end is always to study a variety of data in a variety of languages. And we study the explicating process how the underdetermined sentence meaning is fleshed out. What is the process? To what extent they are linguistically guided, directed, what structure you can use to infer that the sentence is in, to be interpreted in this way or in other ways. And here, looking at different languages, um, will always give us many, many happy surprises because you don't really know that this language and this special structure uh, that can provide proper guidelines to how you enrich this sentence. So native speakers will never get the, any other possible but unnatural interpretations. So um, usually we provide a lot of references, but students, are invited to take a look at some uh, carefully chosen, selected, and hopefully up-to-date ones on which they base uh, their assignment questions. Then they, they design their own question, and then they write up their own assignments. And then um, we have discussions and dialogues afterwards. So. Uh, here is a uh, list of some sample questions I give to our students, but then uh, they are also welcome to design their own questions. And sometimes, again, they surprise me with their wonderful thoughts. So um, I finish at this point with my presentation so that we can uh, leave you enough time for questions. and. Um, I wish to leave you my email address and you are always welcome to write to me for more questions. And I will always be happy to arrange talk back discussions as I have been doing these years. Um, so that if you are interested in our program, but would like to have some more clarifications, please let me know and I can accommodate your time. I wish to make a further announcement is that our translation program is going to hold a promotion no day event um, uh, with the date and the time uh, given here. So if you're interested, then please wait for our further announcements. Thank you very much. And um, I stop here so that you can ask questions. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Jan. That was fantastic. A great insight there. Um, and I've just posted both of your um, email addresses, Jan and Nana, into the chat. So if anyone does want to take you um, both up on that opportunity, please do feel free to find those um, email address contacts just there.
Now we do have um, just over 10 minutes available um, of time left at the end. Um, there have been one or two questions that have come in so far, which we've answered during the session. But if there is anything else you would like to ask now, for Jan or for Nana to respond to live, um, then please do feel free to send them in to us. And while anyone thinks about doing that, um, I was wondering if you'd both be able just to give us a bit of an insight into the dissertation topics that students sometimes um, consider and sometimes they write about and do their research in for, for both of the courses. Would that be OK? Who'd like to start? Yeah, Nana, please. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Dan, and thank you, Yam. So um, if students take a pro uh, translation program, they can choose either um, translation project or translation research project. Majority of students choose um, translation project, and that means students can choose what they want to translate, and they can translate from English to any other languages that we offer, or vice versa. And if it's research dissertation, they have to use theories and methodologies and to discuss around translation and its issues. Um, so it's a proper research dissertation. Um, if students want to, to you know, uh, pursue PhDs, then we normally recommend the students to choose a um, research dissertation rather than translation project. It's simple, but I think it, this explains everything. Yes. Jan, over to you. Thank you very much, Nana. So for MA Linguistics dissertations, uh, we'll we welcome any topic uh, so long as that falls within the expertise of me and my colleagues. Um, but then we would usually advise our students to follow some ideas that they get from attending some particular modules that they're happy with. Uh, so that can make an easier start. But otherwise, and Nana has already told us everything. <laughs> Fantastic. So some great opportunities that are available there. And thinking about potentially those who are interested in going on to do um, further things with their master's courses, we mentioned uh, PhD study and PhD research, I should say. Can you think of any other opportunities that this might open students up to? Um, so actually, SOAS produces many literary translators. And I, um, even when I talk about only Japanese into English, I know six, seven professional literal translators who publish many translations. And so I tend to have students who are interested in um, literary translations, but also there are many students who are interested in subtitles and uh, translating games <laughs> and so on. And, you know, like, a, there are many game companies and some students get the position there, the game companies and so on. Yes, over to you, Jan. Thanks. Um, I would say that um, having a MA degree um, is an, an important asset for anyone who would like to uh, do work, work like language teaching. Yeah, and many times, if you have an MA degree, yeah, you'll be at a better position in um, uh, getting yourself employed because many schools would now like uh, their applicants to have higher qualifications. And certainly, um, uh, I am also aware that many of our students are doing other work, like um, working for companies, but then with very good background in a common language and knowing the rationale of how language works, they can be more welcome. And also there are students who do professional copy editing for publishers. And um, these days they can get a lot of work online because there are people who would like to have a lot of editorial assistance, yeah, even at a, uh, on a one-to-one -one basis. But, I mean, um, polishing, uh, writings for others, uh, that is um, quite acceptable, especially for those um, non-native speakers. I mean, thank you very much. Fantastic, thank you both. Um, we have had a question that's just come through asking about the deadline to apply for the MA translation. Um, do we have that date to hand? 
Um, I th I think it's the end of June. Am I right, Yam? It's normally um, the end of June. Yeah, it's normally the end of June. But then for last year, because of this special situation, yes. our deadline was lifted until yeah. the end of July, if I yes. remember right. In yeah. general, it's the end of June. Uh -huh. Yeah, I think for most most uh, taught masters programs across the school um 30th of june is, is the sort of main deadline there but just wanted to double check we didn't have any specific ones yes. um for translation yeah. and we'll also just share in a moment's time uh, a link to the how to apply for a master's page um so i'll pop that into the chat in just a second and that's got some more information about deadlines and other information that you might need to know on there um, and before we wrap up, I'll just give one more call for any final questions to come through. And while anyone uh, is welcome to submit those, do either of you have any um, advice for someone who might be considering different master's courses at the moment um, and sort of how to make their how to make their application as stand out as possible? Mm -hmm. I think. Oh, yes, it's my mic. Um, I think. For me, what matters is passion. Mm -hmm. If you really like to translate, or if you're passionate about talking about translation, then please do apply. And you have opportunity to write a statement letter. I think that is very important point for me. Because if you have a passion, if you're committed, you can learn how to translate. And that's all matters. <laughs> that's my advice. Me too. I think that um, what we are looking for is really a, a strong interest and commitment in the study of languages and linguistics, and that we have to be stated in the statement. Yes. Right. Um, if someone doesn't mention linguistics at all, then we'll have to write oh. back and ask, are you sure that you want to study <laughs> this <more>? yes. <laughs> degree yes, or yes. not? Yeah. Um, yes. We can write back. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh -huh. Fantastic, thank you both. Yeah. And um, our final questions come through asking about whether anyone will be able to access the recording of this session. Um, so just to confirm the, the recordings will, I believe, um, be uploaded and there should be some information about that. I think they'll be added into a playlist onto our YouTube channel. So just keep an eye on the website and on there. Um, if you don't see them in um, just over a week or so, then feel free to get in touch and um, we can make sure that we make the recording available to you. But that will be there. So that does bring us to the end of the session. Um, if either of you have any parting comments, feel yeah. free now. Sure. If you have any questions, just feel free to email me. You are always welcome. And so nice getting to see you all. And thank you for coming. <laughs> and yes. hope we can be in communication more yes. about languages, translation, and linguistics. Yes. Fantastic. Thank you, Jan. Thank you, Nana. Thank you, um, thank you to all thank of you, our... Thank you, yeah. Thank you. Thank you to all thank of you our for attendees. your great work. Yeah. yeah. See you then. Thanks. See we you. See you soon. See Cheers, you. everyone. Goodbye. Take care. Take care. Bye. Take care.